So, uh, welcome, good morning everyone, and um, welcome to the uh, Academy of the Arts, or Akademie der Künste, as uh, we are being asked to refer to the Academy. Um, welcome George Thrush, and welcome uh, all the visitors from Boston, David Hayseen, Tim Love, and Paul McMorrow. And uh, welcome to the Berlin speakers, who I will introduce uh, in a moment. Uh, this event, which is sponsored by the Northeastern University, uh, with the help of the Academy, is taking place in the context of the exhibition Culture City. Culture City is looking at the relationship between culture and how it impacts on urban development and architecture. So, the exhibition, which is held at the Hanseatenweg site, has a number of buildings historic as well as contemporary, that show and demonstrate how, in a way, culture has become an industry, has become a force in spawning architecture and urban development. Some of which, very successfully, like Bilbao, like Guggenheim Bilbao, and others less successfully. We are here in Germany, so uh, the Ed Philharmonie uh, is still unfinished after so many years. Uh, from an original budget of 150 million, thereabouts, now at 575 million. Uh, and um, in Spain, country of a major financial crisis, the Cidad de Cultura by Peter Eisman, which began uh, with a budget of 120 million, uh, reached with four of the six buildings complete uh, around 400 billion euros. Uh, they just decided last week not to complete the last two buildings, so in fact it's going to remain a torso. Um, we are discussing contested projects, and uh, we're going to focus on two cities, Boston and Berlin. Now Berlin, as you know, uh, all those students who've uh, been here for a while, you will see in the newspapers all sorts of um, controversies discussed, uh, not least Alexanderplatz uh, most recently, and uh, for instance Tempelhof. We will, in fact, focus our attention on Tempelhof. So, rather than to fuel, in the same way as uh, some of the mass media have done, controversy on the basis of I like, I don't like, uh, this morning's session is devoted to ways of analyzing, evaluating projects so that we can begin to talk about these things in more factual. Uh, of course, it will always be emotional, but at least uh, we'll try and address these things in some more structured, factual manners. We're also going to look at ways by which these interactive processes between the public and the promoters, the developers of these projects uh, are engaging in ways by which these contested projects can be discussed in public. And for that, we have Teresa Tapkarhaka here, who uh, is an expert, is an uh, um, planner, an architect here in Berlin. Uh, and she has steered a number of these highly controversial projects. And uh, I'm very happy that she has taken her time and uh, has taken an interest in this um, session. And she's going to present uh, public participation processes. I'm also very happy that uh, Ruth Conroe Dalton is here uh, from uh, Britain. Um, Ruth has uh, studied architecture, worked for architectural practices before she decided to turn to uh, academic research. And she will explain to us ways by which things like root uh, wayfinding processes um, and other analytical processes such as space syntax can be used to objectify the discussion. Um, I'm going to speak about design review boards um, in a moment. Design review boards which themselves are common to many situations, but uh, are not really liked by architects very much, because they 
many architects fear that their, their freedom is being curtailed by other colleagues breathing down your necks. Uh, so, but my basic plea is that uh, this event should be understood in the context of opening the discussion and uh, to create a, uh, a way by which we can actually begin to clearly speak about some of the qualities of designs so that we can evaluate those qualities against our own criteria as to whether these qualities are the appropriate ones or not. Um, yesterday, uh, a British politician passed away, um, Margaret Thatcher. Um, many people in the German media uh, lamented the fact. Uh, I must say, I mean, we spoke about this uh, just now, Ruth uh, and myself. I lived in Britain, I grew up during the era of Thatcherism, and I can't say that I uh, really enjoyed that period. Uh, most people nowadays forget that it was her government that initiated the Big Bang. The Big Bang was the liberalization of the financial markets, which ultimately created the mess that we're in today. So, the debt caused by uh, overindulgent property development can be traced back to liberalization policies of the 80s. And unless you understand that relationship, you don't understand also the excesses in the cultural field. Politicians have dreamt up these wonderful projects, such as the City of Culture in Santiago de Compostela, including the uh, El Philharmonie by Herzog de Mouron, because these things were thought to be financially possible. They've turned out to be disasters, and they are, in a way, the, the tip of the iceberg of what else is a large property speculative bubble. So, we don't need less liberalization, even in the case of design quality. We need more uh, rules and regulations, but we need rules and regulations that are clearly stated and uh, shared amongst the profession and the public in order to debate merits and demerits of designs. So I'm making this kind of very, very big uh, connection between uh, what seems to be a kind of an, a, a tool uh, in the financial market as kind of a innocent thing like, you know, oh, let's liberalize all these things um, and the necessities to create actually tools of regulation and uh, debate in the world of design. I can't say what we should do in the financial markets. I'm not an expert in finances, but I'm an expert in architectural design and urban design, and I, I can only say that that's what we need more, not less. And I will talk about that uh, in my presentation. But thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today, and I hand over to George, who's now going to uh, present the case uh, bringing transparency to controversy. Well, um, thank you all very much for being here. Um, I think Wilfred actually raises some very interesting points as a, by way of getting started. Um, and uh, certainly, the difference in the regulatory environment from, let's say, as far ago as, as 50 years ago and today uh, almost can't be overstated, whether you're in the US or in a European context. And certainly, Margaret Thatcher had an enormous uh, role to play in the transformation of Europe. Um, um, for the college students in the audience, you know, the difference between um, pre-Reagan Thatcher and post-Reagan Thatcher costs for education are about a hundredfold. <laughs> so, so there's no question there's been a big change. I think with regard to uh, regulations, however, and uh, uh, public participation in uh, architecture and urban design, 
unfortunately, we face a very complex landscape where there are a lot of different variables. Um, there are urban design issues, there are energy issues, there are cultural representation issues, and finding the appropriate means by which to measure all of these is one of the things I hope we can at least get started on uh, today. But first off, I just want to make a few very general remarks to get us started. And uh, most of all, I want to thank uh, the Academy and our friends here in Berlin for uh, hosting us here. Um, it's a fabulous building and a fabulous location. I'm delighted that the students can be here uh, taking part in it. Um, and today we're hoping to extend a conversation that we began at a conference in Boston in 2011 um, about public participation uh, in the design of co uh, contested cities since the 1960s. But it's really a topic that has gone far too unnoticed within academic architectural discourse. There are dozens of conferences on other topics uh, that, are, that end up having less to do with what we end up seeing in cities than this topic does. The role of part public participation, of course, has exploded since the 1960s. What began as a patchwork of protests around a variety of different issues has emerged as perhaps the single most important shaper of major urban projects in contested cities around the world. Sometimes it was a desire to protect heritage from the onslaught of post-war post improvement projects or reconstruction projects. Such was the case with the famous destruction of New York's fabled Pennsylvania Station, which galvanized a broad cross-section of citizen activists as nothing had before it. The public thrust itself into the debate alarmed uh, uh, the public thrust itself into the debate alarmed by the speed, scale, and scope of these new post-war projects. What had once been the sole province of experts and leaders was now to be part of a new public conversation about what constituted the good city. And there were meaningfully different points of view on this subject. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, Jane Jacobs, of course, famously battled with legendary New York City planner Robert Moses as she sought to preserve the organic, mixed-use character of her beloved Greenwich Village, among other places, against what she saw as the homogenizing forces of Moses' vast regional plans. Similarly, in Boston, in the late 1960s, activists in Boston and Cambridge worked to thwart a new Interbelt Expressway that would have bulldozed vast swaths of long-established neighborhoods. This work resulted in a substantial political change as it allowed new uses for highway funds that included more city-friendly things like public transit and paved the way for the Central Artery Tunnel Project that gave us the Greenway, uh, a new uh, vast swath of public space about which you'll hear more later today. And Berlin, it is hard to imagine a city that has undergone more substantive physical changes in our own lifetimes than Berlin. From the rubble of the Second World War through the Cold War era, with the vast scar at the city's heart, to the 20 years since reunification, there is so much to discuss on this subject, and I, I know that we will shortly. One of the things we learned in our first conference was that the transition from protest and activism against projects seen as egregious affronts to the values, tastes, or livelihoods of affected citizens was not a smooth one. Clear, simple, transparent rules and guidelines were difficult to come by. And this isn't surprising, as what makes a good community is a broad mix of issues uh, related to memory, design, quality, affordability, and convenience. So while one set of regulations was being assembled to serve memory, as in the rapid expansion of historical commissions and preservation regulations. They might find themselves at odd with maintaining a diverse mix of residents in a community that couldn't afford to both preserve its history and maintain affordability. Similarly, in the very market-driven landscape of United States cities, the measures for the public interest came to be defined as precisely the absence of those in the interest of private developers, like height, bulk, shadows, parking, and leasable square footage. So it seems that though we are now rooted in a, in a series of public processes, uh, we, we are perhaps without the tools necessary to make these efforts successful at optimizing our choices. 
So it seems we must establish some parameters and metrics for how we go about evaluating the built environment. For while public participation has grown enormously in the past 50 years, it is not clear that the methods for ensuring the discussion is fruitful have evolved anywhere near as, as quickly. So my colleague Wilfred Wang will now introduce the subject of design review and design qualities. Thanks very much. Design review. These are known to most architectural students, most who have been uh, through an education at the academy will know what a review is about. It's presenting your work in front of a number of critics and having it analyzed and discussed uh, and debated. Uh, normally, uh, at interim reviews, you have a chance to rework things. At final reviews, that's it. Uh, Painful experiences sometimes, sometimes very enjoyable, mostly uh, the idea of education. This is how we educate our design generations. Uh, in other areas, of course, design re review boards exist. Um, for instance, here in Berlin, um, we have the Baukolleg, uh, initiated by uh, Regula Lüscher, the Senate Building Director, and essentially, these are advisory uh, committees that normally are made up of professionals uh, that are connected to uh, the authorities. They're installed by the authorities, the planning authorities or the building control authorities, and they give, give advice to the political uh, institutions. Uh, and of course, they give advice to the clients. Uh, typically what happens is a uh, developer and uh, an architect would present the project uh, in front of the design review board. Uh, there would be some questions and answers and there would be a set of advice given to the clients and uh, to the architects. They would then go back if necessary, uh, if the design wasn't up to scratch and then they would uh, resubmit. Potentially a very painful experience for both sides. Uh, but. Ultimately, and uh, I think that's been my experience, uh, a very fruitful one. Why would you want to have design review boards? Well, in conservation areas, it's quite clear that, um, especially in UNESCO uh, World Heritage Sites, these things are mandatory. UNESCO requires design review boards to be established in order to ensure that something that has the status uh, given to a place, a city, a building, uh, that, that status can be maintained uh, indefinitely. And so for a city like Wismar, which is um, a city on the Baltic, uh, you see the kind of historic core. Um, typically you have the inner core, which is marked by the yellow line, and then you have an outer area, which is a kind of soft edge marked by the red line that shows this kind of a, a critical zone in which, even though it's not part of the actual historic core to be preserved, yet it would have a physical impact if something negative were to be created within the immediate vicinity of that uh, UNESCO World Heritage. So. Uh, the design review board in the case of uh, Visma actually has jurisdiction over everything that includes the red line. Uh, and what happens there is that architects, developers would come, submit the designs, and in my experience, I, and I served for 10 years on the design review board here, um, typically the designs would have to be reworked at least once, if not twice. Uh, in these kinds of provincial contexts, 
the quality of architecture is such that you would say, you know, you one would just wish that the architects were more talented, to be quite frank. Uh, in other cities like Regensburg, which is, uh, I think, um, it's in Bavaria, uh, it has a very strong and forceful uh, uh, political support. The design review board has been uh, uh, filled with professionals of a, of, of a long-standing and, and kind of um, very, very rich experience, and they have, uh, I think, managed to persuade colleagues, especially uh, those working in Bavaria, um, to provide them with designs of a much higher quality. So I think that there's also um, a qualitative difference between different UNESCO World um, Heritage Sites. But as you can see, in this uh, organizational diagram, the, the different dependencies are absolutely uh, incredible, and uh, they sometimes involve um, you know, high political um, uh, games. Uh, if any one of you has uh, come across the controversy in Dresden, where the city and the state of uh, Saxony insisted on the construction of a bridge within the view corridor of uh, the World Heritage Site of uh, the city of Dresden, uh, that was insisted upon by the, the organizers, the clients, the transport ministry, with the result that the city of Dresden lost its uh, World uh, Heritage Site status because there was such a clash of uh, uh, opinions. And so, in other words, the, the diagram that you see here where uh, the Foreign Office, uh, the Federal Foreign Office is involved and UNESCO um, uh, central offices are involved it's all part of uh, an ongoing process of monitoring uh, and of ensuring that the quality that is being produced in, within the conservation or the UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, actually is appropriate. And sometimes, uh, as in the case of Dresden, it results in the withdrawal of the status, a very painful process. But uh, design review boards also exist uh, for large corporate uh, organizations such as uh, the airport of Munich. Here there is a, uh, a seven-headed uh, seven uh, uh, design review board and that includes an industrial designer, a landscape architect, uh, which um, this board oversees the development of terminal buildings and offices and uh, um, warehouse construction, landscaping all around this airport. Uh, facility. Um, and uh, the, this board is answerable to the property development and uh, the, uh, the corporate development, the two uh, red uh, ovals in this structure. So um, the airport of Munich acts as an independent corporation and uh, is in a way a self-legislating body. So you have from one end of the conservation spectrum to the other end of not necessarily the conservation but the kind of developmental uh, spectrum examples of design review boards uh, being installed and actually working um, quite effectively. So two questions, why and how? Why do we have design review at all and how should it work or how does it function? Um, we need it because uh, we need it to communicate more effectively between the public and specialists. Uh, the developments over the last 20, 30 years has created uh, actually quasi-autistic worlds between the kind of popular way of discussing architecture and design and the very lofty, if not to say, esoteric way of dis uh, discussing dis uh, design. So we actually need these boards to communicate between these uh, two realms and to, to create a kind of a more level uh, field. And of course we want to raise the uh, issue of quality over the issue of quantity. 
Because in normal development parlance, it's the, the bottom line that matters, right? How much net usable uh, space you're going to be able to construct, and ultimately, therefore, how much rent and how much uh, income you're going to have to the expense of design quality. So that is my personal interest uh, in, in, in this issue, but also an, an aspect that has been missing in uh, the, the debate about sustainability. Sustainability has, in essence, addressed things like life cycle analysis, something that you may have come across um, by now, where you can quantify everything in terms of emissions, etc. But you have not, no way of actually addressing the issue of quality. How do you, des how do you assess sustainable aspects of design quality? So we need uh, design review boards in order to raise the level of debate. And ob obviously we want to raise the uh, quality of design. In in, in the kind of carpenter's trade, there's this sentence, uh, measure twice, cut once. And translated into design review board parlance, it is uh, better to review over and over again uh, than to build badly once. Right? If we talk about sustainability, can we afford to construct mediocre, inappropriate buildings? only to be uh, getting rid of those things in 30 years' time? The answer is no, not from my perspective. So how should um, design review happen, or how does, how does it happen at the moment? Well, we have presentations in front of the board. Uh, there's a, an internal review. Uh, there's a recommendation that is made by the board. And then, uh, if necessary, there's a renewed presentation. That's kind of the, the basic principle. Um, but let's talk about the method. I believe that there is not a sufficient way of addressing uh, the analytical side. And uh, I'm personally interested in, in the kind of morphological aspect, the formal aspect, the, the aspects of shapes, forms, and spaces, the quality of the relationship between the parts and the whole. Uh, Ruth will address uh, other issues, but let's talk for the moment uh, about form and space. And for that, we need a descriptive method. We should have uh, an analytical tool, uh, an evaluative tool, and uh, ultimately resulting in uh, synthetic criticism. So if we look at uh, architecture, of course, there's theory and practice Theory covers uh, description, analysis, and evaluation. Practice covers the elements um, and how you bring them together in a synthetic way, incorporating some form of meaning. Um, we can relate these uh, to our vocabulary and the way that uh, we uh, compose syntactically in order to express something semantically. And obviously, we combine theory and practice in this way. The theory is the obverse side of practice. Uh, elements are to description, uh, uh, synthesis to analysis, and meaning is to evaluation. I will, I will give you just uh, these couple of thoughts. Um, there's one basic axiom in the analysis of form, that is, the whole at one level of perception becomes the part of the next higher level of perception. Uh, I'll give you an example. In the Doric column, the individual stone element uh, constitutes an, a part of the shaft. And the way that that drum piece is treated with uh, the fluting and with the entesis uh, makes it part of the overall whole. Uh, one could go on uh, about this, but this is kind of a, a key to the understanding as to way, 
uh, as the way by which we can appreciate architectural form and urban form. I don't really have time to go through this, but let me just uh, run through. Uh, there is a descriptive method, and they, uh, this method involves these aspects of cognition, cognitive variables, and anything up to morphological categories. And the morphological categories include these five levels, construction, tectonic, compartmental, configurational, and contextual. Uh, there is the analytical aspect, which can be uh, split into these three, the morphological relations, the rhetorical, and uh, the semantic relations. And uh, this gives you an overview of uh, the way that I have structured it in my course uh, on architectural criticism, um, and how the semantic relations can be identified. So, uh, the rhetorical relations involve figures of composition and figures of thought, or figures of speech, figures of conception. And uh, um, if, you, if you think about the Doric uh, column, returning to this uh, relation between the part and the whole, the shaft, as a shape, as an overall form, suppresses the individual component. And suppression is a rhetorical figure of uh, um, composition, where the part is being denied its presence as a result of the fluting and the emphasis. And finally, evaluation. Um, there are three points of view. Uh, I believe that there is, uh, uh, obviously there's a subjective point of view, um, there is a, what I call the imminent point of view from the view of the form and space itself, and there's also a discursive point of view which says, what if, if we were to replace something by something else, what, how would that change the meaning? Anyway, um, these are uh, the, the qualities that one can uh, assess and the meanings uh, that one can uh, enunciate ultimately uh, coming up, as I say, with uh, synthetic criticism. And I'm sorry, I have to rush through this, but uh, um, I'm already over my 15 minutes. Um, but that, in a nutshell, uh, is how I have been conducting my, my uh, architectural criticism in, in the last few years, um, based on uh, this kind of development of what I see as a method of uh, analysis and uh, criticism. And I think that if one is able to break down uh, the architectural design, urban design, in those terms, uh, this, is, this enables us at least to look at the formal and spatial qualities of architecture. I'm not talking about uh, all the other things that one can talk about, such as uh, the clarity of wayfinding uh, and uh, the social meaning embedded but at least we can talk about one key issue of architecture, and that is the relationship between idea, the conception, and the design, and the relationship of the parts to the whole within the design. So it's a question of how integrity, how the design integrity is established. And, and that, I think, is a very important aspect to the debate about how we can create kind of more objective way of assessing architectural designs. Thank you very much.